Greetings, this is Ben Woodbury, welcoming you to the July edition of the Friends of History First Wednesday Lecture Series in cooperation with the New Mexico History Museum. We're fortunate today to have with us Andy Otto, Executive Director of the, of the Santa Fe Watershed Association, along with his colleague, William Henry Mee, the unofficial mayor of Agua Fria. Henry has been a longtime resident of the village and has many stories uh, of which he can share. The presentation today will focus on the Santa Fe watershed and its place in uh, New Mexico history. At the end of the uh, presentation, we will have an opportunity to have a live Q&A uh, session. Uh, you will find on both Facebook and YouTube uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, write in on chat and ask your questions, and we will do our best to uh, answer as many as possible in the time in the time allowed. So at this point, let me turn the presentation over to Andy Otto. Great. Well, thank you, Ben. We're uh, glad to be here. Um, I'm the executive director of the Santa Fe Watershed Association. We've been in existence since 1997, uh, and our mission is working on the health and vibrancy of the Santa Fe River watershed. And, and it's the watershed approach that is uh, unique with so many uh, different folks. We're uh, a non-governmental uh, uh, 501c3 nonprofit organization, and uh, we uh, uh, are supported by government grants and private grants and, of course, private donations, too. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the geology first of the Santa Fe River Watershed Association. And I'm going to pull the map up here. Um, so this is our region and the area in red roughly is the uh, Santa Fe River watershed. A key uh, to note here is the fact that, of course, the river runs right through it and uh, right through the middle of it from Lake Peak all the way down to the Rio Grande. The, um, uh, the Santa Fe watershed, it, it's on the eastern side of the Rio Grande Rift. Uh, that's the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. The west side of the rift was actually the Sierra Nascimiento Mountains. Um, and, and these were done, it's, it's about 40 miles difference. And um, these north-south uh, running ridges are part of the lower Rocky Mountains. And the Rocky Mountains have been kind of, they call it the backbone of the North American continent. They have been very stable over the millennia um, with, with minor uh, changes. And, and we see that in Colorado, of course, and in Arizona and in New Mexico. A couple of things that happened though was a block faulting. Basically the area that the Rio Grande is in now um, uh, dropped and compared to the Sierra Nascimiento and the uh, Sangre de Cristos. And this caused, of course, a rift valley where the Rio Grande flows into. The, um, uh, the Jemez uh, Mountains, the Valle Caldera, was a relatively recent addition. And it was that uh, explosion, if you will, uh, that caused uh, a lot of problems for the Santa Fe River. It used to run just straight from east to west into the Rio Grande. Well, when, when this all happened, all of a sudden we had an intrusion. We, it blocked the river. So the river had to head south, as you can see in the area in red, and then it finally found an area to get through to the west in what we now call Canyon Road. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the rocks in the Sangre de Cristos are, are really old. You can tell I'm not a geologist, but they're, they're basically pre-Cambrian and Pennsylvanian era and they're basalt. And the basalt rock is that black rock that you see at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. It's a very old rock that's been laying down um, quite a number of years ago, of course. Um, and then in the uh, Caja del Rio, which is the, what we call now the La Bajara uh, 
the, the drop off, if you will, the, on this map they call it the Mesa Negra. Um, that was a fairly recent uh, event, and um, you know, roughly the 47 miles of the river um, were was caused by the river having to meander through that as well, and so that that gave us this 47 miles of Santa Fe River watershed that we have now. So what's happened since the inception of this uh, uh, rift valley was, of course, the river was starting to flow and it was taking sediments with it. Um, what we have going on is formation of what they call the Santa Fe group of sediments. And these sediments are uh, so important to our aquifers, what are now our aquifers. The lower one was called the Tesuke uh, sediment or Tesuke layer. Um, and this was, uh, uh, it was a pinkish tan, silty sandstone. Um, and it was put down in the Miocene era, which is again, fairly recent, just before the current quaternary uh, uh, era. And, uh, the Antra Formation lies on top of that, and the Antra Formation is our key aquifer area. And it's about 300 feet uh, deep uh, in depth, if you want, in the western side. As you can imagine, these uh, uh, sediment layers are shallower in the east toward the source of the, of the mountains, the, the uh, Sangre de Cristos, and it gets deeper as it flows more toward the Rio Grande. So the Antra Formation has a variety of origins, including poorly sorted alluvial deposits, that's that floodplain type of stuff, um, and gravel deposits. Um, and these have been going on for you know, roughly the last 11 million years. A couple of things that we go on with, with all of this is why, why do we even worry about the geology? Well, it's the geology that created the watershed and the watershed that provides the water that brings the plants, animals, and people to this small corner of the Southwest. So with that, I'm gonna introduce William Henry Mee, the unofficial mayor of Agua Fria, longtime associate and friend, and a guy who knows more about what's happened in our little watershed uh, for the last five, six, well, 2,000 years. So William Henry Mee, thank you. Thank you, Andy, and, and it's great to be here. Uh, with the uh, Friends of History. And uh, so I'm going to uh, share my screen. And let's see, and I'll, I'll give you a presentation on uh, a lot of things that I've learned over the years, and especially um, um, with uh, um, Agua Fria Village, because that's where I'm from. So uh, it's kind of an obscure village, but uh, we've always been interested in history. And that's why um, my subtitle is the Santa Fe River Valley's Forgotten History. And these are my acknowledgments here. Um, you know, we've worked a lot with the Northern Rio Grande National Heritage Area, and we uh, did some oral history interviews of Agua Fria residents um, for the New Mexico Historic Records Advisory Board. Um, so, you know, building on what Andy was saying, uh, you know, a billion, almost a billion years ago, uh, we were underwater. So that's a, an amazing uh, kind of uh, fact. Um, and, you know, when you go out to my area, and this is a picture from the Nancy Rodriguez Community Center. You can see little nibs on the mountains, and those are all the volcanic cones in the Caja del Rio Grande. Um, and you know, here's some mount, uh, a mountain view uh, from uh, the Puaque Valley, um, and you know, the snow pack was a really important thing for. Um, you know, how the, the river uh, started to erode the Santa Fe River Valley. And here's a, a picture you don't see too often, but you can actually see the two reservoirs and they're, they're um, uh, snow covered at this point. 
and um, Tom Blog uh, took an airplane photo of them. Uh, so each spring as the mountain snowpack melted, huge floods deposited topsoil along the Santa Fe River, creating an alluvial plain. And this fertile area was perfectly suited for irrigated farming because of its to topography of a slight gravity flow back towards the Santa Fe River. And Native Americans were attracted to this place dating back uh, 7,000 BCE. And we actually discovered some pit houses at the uh, Pindi Pueblo excavations in Agua Fria. And so, in fact, almost as soon as peoples came across the land bridge from Asia, you know, 13,000 BCE, they wound up in New Mexico. And we have the Clovis, Folsom, and Sandia Man uh, sites, and they all date back to 12,000 BCE. Um, you know, across the 47 miles of the Santa Fe River um, that Andy mentioned, and actually it's only 46 now that's flowing because the uh, Cochiti Dam project took up about a mile of that. Um, there's eight laboratory of anthropology, um, also known as LA sites, uh, in Agua Fria. And, you know, there's many archaeological sites, um, you know, found under the Santa Fe Convention Center, uh, Cienaguitas, La Cienaguilla, uh, at the San Antonio Capilla, at Alamo, at La Cienaga, at La Bajada, at Peña Blana, Peña Blanca, and Cochiti. Um, and these sites were inhabited for maybe 100 to 300 years, and we don't really know why they would abandon a site and build a, a whole new site. Um, you know, maybe the, um, the ground that they were farming kind of played out, or uh, maybe it was some kind of religious context that they um, were thinking of. But most of these sites fall into the time period 1100 to 1400. And the patrimony of these sites is claimed by Tsuki Pueblo. So here's a, a picture of Sherry Sheck, and it look, doesn't look too good, but uh, she's of Southwest Archaeology Consultants, and she did all the excavation there in Agua Fria. And our, our major site dates back to 3500 uh, BCE, and she's at the um, annual Pecos Conference, which is at the Pecos um, National Monument, and all these archaeologists get together and discuss what they're working on. So she did a 2009 excavation of our Agua Fria Road because we were putting in a sewer system, and they went down 12 feet for that excavation. Here, the, uh, uh, this is the water tank site, and you can kind of see to the uh, left-hand side, there's an actual water tank. Um, and I volunteered on this site. And we just went in and looked at, at what uh, was there. Um, it was very interesting archaeology. Um, you know, there were three major Santa Fe River floods that covered um, this, this site. Uh, but the people, you know, continued to live there. Um, and by 1400, all the pueblos along the Santa Fe River were abandoned, <clears throat> except for, you know, Santa Domingo, which is now Caris, <clears throat> and Cochiti. Pindi Pueblo was resettled in 1425 and was abandoned by 1450. <clears throat> There's no known reason for this. So, you know, we, we have the Spanish exploration. And of course, it starts with Coronado in 1539. Um, he crisscrosses the Santa Fe River several times and gets all the way up to Taos. Um, the Chamuscando Rodriguez in 1581, um, they went through all uh, the Santa Fe area. Uh, 1582, Antonio de Espejo went um, and, you know, the explorers were probably looking for gold. I mean, you know, some type of riches. Uh, but they just really went all over. And they saw a bunch of ruins 
um, but they didn't understand what they were all about. Uh, in 1590, uh, Castaño de Sosa, um, he went um, up the Galisteo River and then into the Santa Fe area. And uh, uh, he spent quite a bit of time there, but it was an unauthorized expedition. See, all these expeditions, you had to pay tribute to the crown to get a royal license or, you know, you were, you were uh, in, uh, you know, you were conducting a legal expedition. And then lastly, Onate. So the Camino Real, you know, runs from Mexico City um, to San Juan Pueblo and even into the San Luis Valley in Colorado. And, you know, the explorers basically followed Native American trails that were quite well established for a thousand or two thousand years before this. So the um, uh, Camino Real, uh, you know, Onate came up this way, but um, there was also an old Spanish trail that branches off from uh, what is San Juan Pueblo on this map, or, or Onate's um, San Gabriel, his capital of Nuevo Mexico. And uh, uh, that old Spanish trail goes all the way out to California. And so when, when we look at the archaeological records at Pindi Pueblo in Agua Fria, we find um, seashells and little tiny small seashells that were probably made into necklaces. And they were traded um, with some type of California uh, Native Americans. And, you know, we're not sure. They probably traded turquoise for, for those uh, uh, shells. And they got the turquoise from the Surreal Seals uh, down on Highway 14. And when they did some tests of some of the uh, uh, Aztec idols, solid gold idols with turquoise as their eyes, and uh, that turquoise actually came from Surreos also. Um, and then there was also a, uh, in the uh, Mexican National Museum, there's a turkey feather robe that one of the uh, 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 medicine men of the Aztecs used. And that robe, the turkey feathers came from um, the northern New Mexico area. And in our 2009 um, archaeological study, we actually uh, found a half of a, of a turkey robe in that uh, uh, archaeology. And here's uh, uh, another uh, uh, map of the Camino Real, and it was this um, uh, Dr. Roland Willard traveled uh, the El Camino Real in 1825, which is kind of, you know, probably he was one of the first Anglo uh, people to have traveled uh, the Camino. So on January 8th, 1598, Juan de Anate, he takes off from El Paso del Norte. Uh, by July 11th, they reach the Native American village of Okeawinge uh, that they named San Juan. And Onate builds this temporary camp uh, just off to the side of that, and they name it San Juan de los Caballeros, um, and that, meaning that, you know, they were the guys with the horses, right? Uh, and a few months later, they moved to the old village of uh, Yuke Yonge, and that was west of the Rio Grande. And this is what they named uh, San Gabriel, and that became the capital of, uh, of Nuevo Mexico. So here's a Agua Fria timeline, and because my specialty is in Agua Fria village, and so we've got the 7,000 uh, BCE pit houses, 3,000 BCE, the first large settlement, and you know, initial um, writings about this say that it may be the oldest, largest 
uh, settlement in the continental USA. And what enabled them to um, do this was that they domesticated turkeys. And uh, so Pindi uh, actually means turkey in the Tewa language. So uh, uh, Pindi Pueblo loosely translated because it goes across uh, two languages, uh, uh, Tewa and, and Spanish, that it would be Turkey Town. So, uh, uh, you know, I always, I always get a, a, a giggle out of that one. Um, then our, our next, um, you know, we, call, we often talk about it in terms of three distinct civilizations. So our second one, from 100 BCE to 800 of the Common Era is our second large settlement. And then our third one is from 1100 to 1450, and that'd be our third large settlement. Um, and then if we just look at the historic uh, records that we have, uh, Francisco de Madrid uh, got a land grant for the Agua Fria area in 1640. And he may have uh, come to Agua Fria as early as 1603, because that's when he left El Paso uh, on an expedition. And 1776, Fray Dominguez lists 57 families and 297 people in Pueblo Quemado. And that was kind of the historic name for the Agua Fria area. And there is actual Pueblo Camado. And if you go out on West Alameda, uh, there's a road named Pueblo Camado. And Pueblo Camado existed along the Santa Fe River for about a mile. Uh, but a lot of the actual uh, room blocks and stuff have actually been taken out by um, floods and, and soil erosion. Um, so in 1846, uh, Agua Fria um, makes the first American map. Um, uh, Lieutenant Albert um, of, of the uh, American Expeditionary Force um, maps our area and calls Agua Fria, Agua Fria for the first time. So here's a, a picture um, from, um, uh, actually from the, uh, uh, history Museum, uh, and it shows these turkey pens that have been excavated by Stubbs and Stallings in uh, 1932 to 33. And uh, uh, the cedar for the turkey pens actually never rotted when these roofs collapsed on top of them. So they actually were able to find these turkey pens. And this is an article by uh, Eric uh, Blinman and um, uh, Stephen Post, two archaeologists, and uh, you can find it under uh, uh, when the turkeys come home to roost in the December uh, 2013 issue of the uh, El Palacio magazine. Uh, this is a map I drew because uh, uh, in, in doing our oral history interviews, uh, there were about 35 uh, site names that Agua Fria residents that were born, um, say, before 1960, they knew, but, you know, these no longer are really on the map. And uh, so it's a historic Agua Fria map. And in 1909, um, the U.S. Uh, Surveyor General uh, went and, and formally surveyed the area. And if you notice, there are all these long, skinny uh, tracks, some of them only um, as small as 99 feet. Um, and the reason for that is that then each tract had the access to the acequia to, to get water to their properties. And here's a, 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 a picture based on the 1914 
uh, State Engineers Hydrologic Survey. And it was this kind of made into a diorama by um, a, a firm from Boston called Content Design. And they, uh, uh, they knew the ex location of, from the state engineer's maps of all the houses, all the acequias, and all the fields and what was growing in each field. So they just, uh, uh, you know, colored it in that way. Um, at the very bottom of the map is the Santa Fe River. And it was pretty much running year round uh, when there weren't dams on it. Um, so we have an uh, uh, old Browning camera here. Um, it was, you know, the people in Agua Fria were very poor. And so they didn't have any photographs of uh, events, uh, but they would invite in this man his name was El Senor, and no one knows who this person is. Um, and he would take pictures of weddings and, and feast days and that kind of thing. And that's why we have um, the photographic record that we have. And most of these uh, photos actually have wound up in um, the photo archives at the uh, uh, History uh, Library of the, of the Cultural Affairs Department. Um, and, you know, this is a, a photo of my wife's uh, grandfather. He's leading the donkey. And there's several, uh, uh, a boy and, and, and five girls from Amorfria Village. And this was kind of a, a gag photo that um, the Museum of New Mexico uh, traveling uh, uh, photographers did. And this is about 1912. And, uh, you know, so all of the, You'll see in Tsuke Village, you'll see the same picture. You'll see it in La Cienega. Uh, uh, but that's all of our photographic history. And so I'm going to go kind of quickly through some uh, photos here. Here's uh, um, uh, corn being uh, roasted in an orno. And this is from uh, uh, Tomas Romero. But, you know, this is the way that people lived. Here's the... Uh, um, our uh, general store that belonged to the Romeros. It was probably open about 1900. We know it, it, it existed in the 1905 business directory and it went out of business about 1955. And this is uh, 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 the new general store run by um, Jose Antonio Romero's uh, nephew, Amarante Romero, he started in 1951 and he went out of business in 1991 and uh, he blames Walmart for that. Um, here's Augustine Torres and this is 1941 and uh, he's generally considered the last man to drive a wagon on the El Camino Real in the uh, Santa Fe County area. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, Bernabe, um, uh, um, Romero, and he has his pet goat and he's going uptown and he used to, uh, he was the last man, uh, probably to free range goats up until like the 1970. And he just went up the Santa Fe river and had them graze. Here's the, uh, um, uh, uh 4-H club um, uh, sponsors, and they had a float in the Fiesta Parade that year. Here's the, uh, uh, the Women's uh, Altar Society for the San Ysidro Church. Here, here they are plastering. This, this was called women's work. Uh, the women actually plastered the San Ysidro Church, and this was in about 1930. Here's another picture of that, another one. And here's the interior of the San Isidro Church in 1915. Um, this is a kind of a, a San Isidro Day celebration. Um, San Isidro, of course, is the patron saint of farmers. And so all the girls would dress up and, and uh, then they would pick a queen uh, for San Isidro Day. And they had all types of festivities then. 
Uh, let's go through some of these all time photos. Um, we're going to present uh, the PowerPoint to you later and you'll be able to see the uh, citations for these photos and, and, and where they're at. But we've got orchards. This is what they call the rooster pool. And this happened um, each uh, year on uh, uh, June 24th, El Dia de San Juan. And they had a little fiesta. This is also the, uh, um, the rooster pool. And you can't quite see it, but in the center of the photo here um, is a man actually trying to pull the rooster out of the ground. Um, and, and then he would, once he got it, he would take it to his relatives and they would cook it up. And it was really a good way to get rid of those young roosters in the uh, uh, chicken pens that were uh, causing a lot of problems. Here's a double Arno. I'm not quite sure how that was used. And here's Alamo Lane in Obafria, probably about 1900. Here's the church in uh, about 1880. Here's, um, um, oh gosh, it's uh, uh, our, our wood carver, um, uh, Gallegos, that uh, uh, he's very famous. He had exhibits in the Chicago Museum of Modern Art. And he just carved uh, Santos. Um, this is my mother-in-law, and she's about four years old. And she's standing in front of uh, some uh, uh, corn stalks that have been harvested. And these are going to uh, keep the animals uh, you know, fed throughout the winter. Here's butchering a, a sheep. Um, and people started to uh, lay adobes. Uh, as a way of uh, making a living. Um, probably about 1945, the um, acequias just weren't uh, producing any water for the people. Uh, that's, that was spring cleaning. Um, here's the sister uh, taking all of the uh, people for a picnic down by the Santa Fe River. And we have so few pictures. Here's the Albafria School, the county school. Um, here's uh, Sam Montoya in 1919. He's doing what they called vamos a trampe. So they would hitch a ride on a train and they would go out to uh, uh, a railroad site and work there. And then they would build up enough money to have a dowry to come back to Agua Fria and uh, marry um, their, their bride of their choice. Um, these guys are miners. Uh, same with these guys. This is Jose Lino Montoya and his, his wife, Elisa, in 1898. Um, uh, and here's a, a, a letter um, that was written um, to ask for uh, the hand uh, in marriage of, of a woman. So you had to be very formal about these things. Uh, so the, actually, this Martin Baca wrote it for um, uh, Hilario uh, Baca because uh, you know he was kind of like his uncle, and you couldn't you couldn't directly speak to the uh, uh, the woman's father. Uh, you had to go through channels. Um, so you know, here's World War II. On the uh, right is Ostaquio Lopez. Uh, he was our most decorated soldier in Agua Fria, but, you know, so many of them um, volunteered and, and had all kinds of citations. Um, but they all left to, to, to fight in the war. And so basically no one was left um, to, to do the farming in the village. And there was an order um, from, uh, this, uh, I guess, the, uh, the federal government to close the acequias um, so that the water could be diverted to like Bruns Army Hospital and uh, uh, also the, um, uh, the Japanese um, prisoner, well, or Japanese concentration camp in Casa Solana. And so all the water went uh, for their um, production of vegetables. 
Um, this is a, a map that uh, you can actually see on the Santa Fe River uh, Trail. Um, and <clears throat> it's an early 1949 uh, photo. Um, and it just says, you know, some of the points. But you can already see that the, um, the Santa Fe River is kind of widening out. There's already been some uh, sand and gravel operations. Uh, um, oh, my internet connection is unstable, it's saying here. Here's the Monte Vista feed store. Um, this is the Maradomo Herman Montoya uh, of, of the uh, uh, Santa Fe Acequias. Uh, here's John Stevenson in 1978. He's in his cornfields for the uh, Santa Fe Community Farm. This is a picture out of the New Mexican. And uh, um, let's see, here's the El Camino Real Park Trailhead. We have a number of uh, uh, county and city parks along the river now. Um, eventually, we'll have a 26 mile long trail along the river. And uh, uh, one of our partners is the National Park Service in this project. Uh, the federal BLM has, has uh, sold us land to Santa Fe County. And uh, uh, we're really trying to restore a lot of the river, um, you know, because of that devastating uh, sand and gravel um, uh, excavations. Um, you know, and the America Byways uh, is in partnership with the, uh, um, the National Park Service and the, uh, uh, the CARTA, the Camino Real Association. And they've done a uh, marking of, of the historic Camino Real Trail. Um, what we have a, a, a really great uh, county open space and trails program. And their vision for all of these trails is called the Grand Unified Trail System, or GUTS. And so you can see trails throughout the, the uh, uh, Santa Fe River area, but also along its tributaries, uh, tributaries um, like uh, Arroyo de los Frijoles, Arroyo Chamiso. Um, you know, it's just a, a real preservation event uh, that's going on. And, you know, thank you for, for looking at that. And, um, you know, I, on each one of these slides, I actually have notes of where their citations come from. Uh, little side stories. Um, so if you want to browse through that at, at a later point, uh, please feel free. free. And thank you uh, to the Friends of History for in putting this together. <laughs>